In this video, I'm going to discuss my search pattern and basic approach to the CT angiogram of the head and neck. This is an exam that is ordered for a few reasons. And the first one and the most common reason that I see this ordered is because someone's presenting with stroke-like symptoms and the neurologist or emergency medicine doctor is wanting to see if there is a large vessel occlusion, like a proximal large vessel occlusion within the brain that a neurointerventional radiologist or neurosurgeon could potentially go in and do something called a thrombectomy and take out the clot and potentially preserve a lot of brain tissue that hasn't already completely infarcted. The CTA of the head specifically is also useful in looking for aneurysms and then in the setting of trauma if there's a really bad skull base fracture and you're worried about vascular injury you could also get a CTA. And the same goes for the neck. For the neck you're looking for stenosis or occlusion similar to what you're looking for in the brain and you're also looking for vascular injury like the CTA of the neck specifically is ordered all the time at my institution for trauma. Patients that come in after car accidents or significant falls and they're worried about vascular injury to either the carotids or the vertebral arteries, a CTA of the neck is ordered a lot of the time. If you're worried about an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, the CTA of the head is definitely indicated. And of course, occlusion either in the neck or the brain is another reason to get a CTA. So I'm going to start with the head. I, I like to break these up, CTA of the head and then CTA of the neck. I start with the head and start with the vessels because that's what this study is ordered for. I actually start with the anterior circulation. So what I'm first going to do is point out the carotid arteries. So this is the left internal carotid artery here. This is the right internal carotid artery here. And I pick one side. I usually start on the right and I follow one of those into the brain and I'll show you exactly how I do that. So here's the right internal carotid artery here and I follow it, making sure that the vessel looks open. It looks regular. There's not any weird narrowing or stenosis. And I follow that into the brain to the carotid terminus, which is the very last portion of the carotid artery, which is about right here. So the carotid terminus branches into the middle cerebral artery, which is right here. This is the right middle cerebral artery, and this is the M1 segment. So this is the first and most proximal segment of the right middle cerebral artery. I track the middle cerebral artery, and you see it branch. It's going to branch right around here. As I keep scrolling, these are the branches of the right middle cerebral artery. I follow those branches. Again, you're looking for occlusion. So if you, you see contrast here, and then all of a sudden you don't see contrast, that is the sign of a vascular occlusion. And I just follow those arteries out. And again, in addition to occlusions, you're looking for aneurysms or weird irregularity or change in caliber of the vessels. There are lots of different pathologies that can manifest as irregular narrowing and then dilation of the vessels, one of them being reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. You have intracranial cerebral vasculitis. And of course, atherosclerotic disease can also cause areas of stenosis. So that's our right middle cerebral artery. It branches to become the M2 segments. And then from M2, you have more distal M3 and M4 vessels. And I just wanna make sure there's no proximal occlusion, meaning nothing in the M1 segment and nothing at least in the M2 segments. And again, these are the M2s here. These arise right after the branch point off the M1, so M2s. Then I try to follow that out as far as I can to make sure nothing's occluded. In addition, in the anterior circulation to the middle cerebral artery, you also have the anterior cerebral artery. The A1 segment comes off the carotid terminus, and it's actually hypoplastic on the right here. So I'll show you the left. This is the A1 left anterior cerebral artery segment. They then become the A2 segments after the anterior communicating artery, which is somewhere around here. It's a really small artery, but it's a common place for aneurysms. So it's important to localize where at least it should be, even if it's really hard to actually see it because it's such a small vessel. And then these are the anterior cerebral arteries up here and you can trace those and make sure they're open and make sure you don't see an aneurysm. So we have a hypoplastic right A1 anterior cerebral artery segment, and then we have our left a1 anterior cerebral artery segment coming off the carotid terminus. And then on the left, I do the same thing as I did on the right. I look at the M1 left middle cerebral artery segment, make sure it's open, make sure I don't see an aneurysm. Find the branch point. The branch point is right about here. You have your M2s. These are the M2s here. You follow those out, make sure they're not occluded. Again, you're looking for aneurysms, vascular irregularity. I don't see any of that here. This is entirely normal other than the hypoplastic or diminutive A1 segment on the right. So that's the anterior circulation. And those are the high points, the things you definitely want to look at. Then you go to the posterior circulation. The posterior circulation arises from the vertebral arteries. I'm starting with the intracranial right V4 vertebral artery segment. That's here. You follow that up. It gives off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. That's what just branched off there. I follow up the V4 segment. It joins with the V4 segment on the left. 
I do the same thing on the left. I watch it, making sure it's not occluded, highly stenosed, or any sort of irregularity. These two join to form the basilar artery. So this is the basilar artery right here. The basilar artery is extremely critical. If that one is occluded, that is an emergency. If someone has an occluded basilar artery, they can end up with locked in syndrome. For those watching this that have been through med school or are in med school, you've maybe heard of this at this point. It's famously known for something where you're completely paralyzed, but you're able to move your eyes and that's it. So that's locked in syndrome. So if you see a basilar occlusion, meaning you don't see contrast, that's a problem. The basilar artery has several branch points and I'm gonna jump just to the posterior cerebral arteries. This is the left posterior cerebral artery coming off the very end of the basilar. And you can kind of follow the PCA as it heads towards the occipital lobe. And similarly, we have the right posterior cerebral artery right here coming off the basilar. And that's our right PCA coursing posteriorly into the right occipital lobe. So I try to track that, follow that as distal as I can. So that is the brain. After looking at the arteries, I then look at the brain parenchyma itself. Even if you have a prior CT head that's already been ordered and you've already read it, the good thing about the CTA is that you can kind of get an idea if there's ischemia to the cortex. What I like to do is look at the gray-white differentiation and I'd window it a little bit differently and I can't window it on this program that I'm using. But if I could, I would window it and try to get nice contrast between the white matter and the cortex and just look for any areas of loss of gray-white differentiation that can indicate a stroke. And just like any CT head, obviously you're looking for mass effect, blood, extra axial, intraparenchymal blood, either one. You're looking for all the things that you look for on a normal CT head. You just also are really focused in on the arteries on this exam. So that is the basis for the CTA of the head. I then look at the sinuses and all the extracranial stuff. I'm not gonna get into that here. And that's my basic approach to the CTA of the head. So now onto the CTA of the neck. Identifying the aortic arch. Here's the aortic arch here. There's actually a stent in the aortic arch and kind of into the descending aorta there. I start with the aortic arch, make sure there's not any irregularity there. There's all sorts of things you can see in the aortic arch, dissection flap, intramural hematoma, or a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. I don't see any of those things, but I do see a stent. After looking at the aortic arch, I look at the three major branch vessels, and I'm gonna go through those three now. So we have three vessels here. These are the three branch vessels of the aortic arch. This one on the right, on the patient's right, is the brachiocephalic trunk. We then have the left common carotid artery, and then we've got the left subclavian artery. So here's the subclavian. You can see it here becomes the axillary artery and it's kind of obscured by contrast. So that's that one. Be sure to look at that one. I then go to the right brachiocephalic trunk, which becomes the right subclavian, which is this one. And then the right common carotid artery. And that's one you're gonna track all the way up. You then have the left common carotid artery here. So I pick one side, let's start with the left, and you just track that left common carotid artery all the way up until it bifurcates into the external and internal carotid arteries. The external carotid artery is not as important most of the time and almost all the time that these studies are ordered, but it's important to identify it and look at it. But I'm going to focus in on the internal carotid artery and I just keep tracking that up until it becomes the intracranial segment, which we already looked at. And again, you're looking for stenosis, weird irregularity in the lumen or an outright occlusion. All of those things you want to identify. I do the same thing on the right. I'm doing this a little bit faster here just for the sake of time, but you look at the right, you'll see the bifurcation now, and then you have the internal and external carotids, and again, tracking that all the way up into the intracranial portion. And then we next have the cervical vertebral arteries. These come off the subclavians almost always. Sometimes a vertebral artery can arise directly from the aortic arch. In this case, here is the V1 segment of the right vertebral artery of the neck coming off the subclavian here. And I would just track that up doing the same thing that I did for the carotids, looking for irregularity in the lumen, outright occlusion, or a pseudoaneurysm, which can be seen in the setting of trauma. The same thing on the left. It's not uncommon to have one that's much bigger than the other side. And we just call that a dominant versus non-dominant vertebral artery. In this case, these vertebral arteries and the carotid arteries for that matter are normal. And again, they pierce the dura, go into the skull and form the basilar artery. So you wanna track those and make sure you don't find any irregularities. In this case, the carotid and vertebral arteries are normal. So after you're done looking at the arteries, we're responsible for everything else. I've done a lot of different videos on like how to approach CT of the chest. You have some chest in here. So I kind of just break down my search pattern. 
I think about my search pattern for the chest and just do that for the portion of the chest that I see. So you're looking at the lungs, the vertebral bodies, the ribs, the soft tissues of the chest. You've got the thyroid. And in fact, there's a thyroid nodule. So there are some things you can find. You've got an endotracheal tube. That's an endotracheal tube here because you're looking at the trachea. You've got an enteric tube that's in the esophagus. You see a little bit of the mediastinum. So it's important to check out the mediastinum. So there's some things in the chest that you're responsible for, the soft tissues of the neck, the spinal canal. There's all sorts of things that you need to think about. Again, we're responsible for everything on the image. So I look at the bones of the neck, of the chest. I'm looking in the spinal canal. I'm looking in the soft tissues, looking for enlarged lymph nodes, soft tissue fluid collections, abscesses. And one important thing to think about is someone presenting with neurologic symptoms, don't forget to think about the spinal canal and the spinal cord. Patients can present with weakness or some sort of focal neurologic deficit, and it's very easy to hone in on the arteries and think there's a stroke that you need to identify, when in reality there is a large hematoma within the canal, like an epidural hematoma that's compressing the cord, and that's why someone has neurologic deficits. So looking in the canal and just making sure you don't see anything grossly wrong in there is important. I've heard stories of things like that being missed. In this case, this canal is patent, and I don't see any blood or mass or anything in the canal, but always look in the canal. Uh, it's an important thing, and there are some very, very important things that can be caught in the canal if you see them. Thank you all so much for watching, and see you next time.